Welcome everyone. My name is Amy Coney and I'm the Associate Dean of Operations for the School of Workforce Development, which is a really long title to try to put on a business card. Um, it just means that I get to work with people like Felix who gets to work with people like you. So that's a cool thing. Um, I wanna welcome you to our third annual GRCC idea pitch, so that's pretty cool. This competition actually strives to promote you guys and the uh, great ideas that you have, um, ones that I will never be able to come up with. So I bow to all of you because I've sat through three of these plus the regionals and it's just really cool to hear what you guys have to tell us so and the ideas that you can think of. So I do encourage you, just as Felix just said, please don't sweat it, you're gonna do great. It's it's okay, you know your content better than anyone else, so it's gonna be just fine. The top three winners here are going to receive 800 for first, 300 for second, and 100 for third. And in addition, the top two will advance to the regional pitch competition. That is actually an event um, that we're in collaboration with the West Michigan Colleges and Universities Group, affectionately called WIMCUG. <laughs> Isn't that an awful acronym? Um, but those universities and colleges, we come together and we try to put on these events regionally to foster the innovation that is coming out of you guys. And so Davenport, Hope, Kelvin, GVSU, Aquinas, Cornerstone, and ourselves will each advance two um, of their top two finalists to the regional pitch, which will be next week, Wednesday, November 7th at six o'clock, hosted by Aquinas. Um, so even if you don't get to advance, I would hope that you would go and spur on um, your fellow colleagues here. We wanna thank that group, the WIMCUG group, as a special thanks, but also the GRCC Business Department who has come behind this, as well as the Business Department head, Felix, and you know his, he's also the professor, so we can't go without saying thank Thanks to him because the, he is really behind this. Um, I just write the checks. Uh, he does all of the work, so I can't say enough thanks to him. So I'm going to turn it over to you, Felix. Thank you very much, Amy. And Amy's behind the scenes and helping us uh, accomplish this, so she's being very humble today. Uh, Nancy, and uh, there are many people uh, behind the scenes at GRCC. Uh, not only the professors, but the staff that make this happen. Today's a special day. It's our third annual idea pitch competition. Every business starts with an idea, whether it's for profit or nonprofit. And every business is headed by an entrepreneur. Entrepreneurs are much different than anybody else. While most people avoid change, entrepreneurs run toward that change. While most people fear uncertainty, the entrepreneur views uncertainty as an opportunity uh, to create change in the marketplace. And today, we have 15 entrepreneurs that are going to talk about their ideas uh, for solving problems in the marketplace. Because that's really what innovation is about, is solving problems, creating products and services and processes that add value within the marketplace. And because they add value, they become an innovation. So it all starts with an idea, it leads to an invention, and then eventually, if it adds value in the marketplace, then we have an innovation. So we have 15 innovators here today uh, sharing their ideas, and we're very, very happy. Um, sometimes what happens is that people ask, what happens after these idea pitch competitions? What happened in tw after 2010? What happened after 2011? Uh, today I gave several interviews, and in those interviews, that was the number one question. Did anything come about? Well, a lot of things come about because it takes a lot of courage to stand on stage for 90 seconds and pitch an idea. An idea pitch is also known as an elevator pitch because if you were in an elevator, an important person came on, they said, what do you do? You have 90 seconds to tell them. If you get their interest and pique their interest, they ask you a few questions, they might ask you back to their office or make an appointment, and they could help you build a business, maybe invest in that business. So that's really what an idea pitch is. When you go to an interview, that's a longer idea pitch, and the idea is them hiring you. So basically, doing what you're going to do takes a lot of courage, and our hat's off to you. Now, what has happened since uh, 2010 and 2011? Uh, first of all, I could tell you that da Dallas Bardock, what he did was he created a home brew uh, company. He presented, and even though he did not win the top three slots here, he competed just like you are with the 15 finalists. And after the idea pitch, and after enrolling, 
in BA 276, our business innovation course, halfway through that course, Dallas went to five by five night, uh, sponsored by Rick DeVos. Uh, it's an entrepreneurial forum. And basically the five by five stands for, you have five minutes to win up to $5,000 of venture capital seed money. Dallas won the full $5,000 and now has started a microbrew cooperative. So after the idea pitch, he took it to the next level. Uh, several people uh, have gotten paid internships. Uh, Courtney DeHaan, after presenting at Idea Pitch, uh, she ended up with a very prestigious paid internship for one year at Steelcase. Uh, when, when she asked, why did you hire me out of all the students that applied for this internship, uh, they basically went back to, you were the one that was able to talk about ideas, new ideas, and innovation better than anybody else. Also, uh, we had Jason Schimmel, who ended up with a prestigious internship paid for a full year after presenting at Idea Pitch at the Right Place Company and working for Bill Small. Now this was very prestigious. Uh, what Jason was able to do every week is call on small, medium, and large manufacturing companies and he dealt with the owners and the CEOs. That's what he did every week for a full year. Now, he's also here, Jason Schimmel, if you could just uh, please, can we give him a big round of applause? <laughs> Jason Schimmel, two weeks ago, also presented at what was formerly 5x5, five five, which was combined with another program to help entrepreneurs called Momentum. They combined both of those programs into Start Garden. Two weeks ago, the public voted Enterpriser, an idea that was presented here by Daniel Gore and Michael Korn, with the help of Jason Schimmel. The public voted that as the number one idea, and Jason won $5,000 of seed money uh, to pursue that idea, and he's going to get a team to work with him over the next 90 days. And uh, Enterpriser is a social media platform that basically helps entrepreneurs look for talents and skills in the marketplace, so it's tapping into that big craze with social media that we need today. So again, hats off to you, Jason, for doing that. We have three judges here, and I know these judges very, very well. I've known uh, two of the judges here for well over 30 years. Uh, let me first start off by introducing uh, Randy Walters, if we could have a, ran a round of applause for Randy Walter. <laughs> Randy Walter is a chief engineer and a senior technologist at GE Aviation, and for well over 30 years, uh, you could basically thank uh, the safe skies uh, due to people like Randy, who are basically coming up with innovations in the field of aviation. So. Uh, we have two engineers because I'm going to introduce Tony here in a moment. You know what, America? America became great because we make stuff. And the entrepreneur knows that if we make stuff, eventually we need to get an engineer involved or a scientist. So it's great that we have two engineers today. They're going to be helping all of you and asking you good questions on, on uh, the, tech, the technology behind that or, or the logic and the reason behind that. Engineers are very good at problem solving that way. Um, so thank you very much, Randy, for agreeing. Randy was a judge in 2010 and did a superb job. Tony Bowie. Tony Bowie, if we could give a round of applause for Tony Bowie. Uh, Tony Bowie is a chief engineer uh, over at um, GE Aviation as well, and he's been there for well over 30 years. In fact, both Randy and Tony have been there from Lear Siegler to Smith Industries and then GE Aviation. Uh, Tony, to me, is probably one of the most uh, intelligent geniuses that came out of Latin America. He's from Nicaragua, so he helps me with my Spanish all the time. And uh, he, both, uh, both Randy and Tony uh, are just brilliant at uh, logic and uh, creating stuff and knowing the technology that goes behind everything that we use today. So thank you very much, Tony, uh, for agreeing to be with us today. I want to also say uh, that Tony uh, does a lot of charity work as well. Uh, he helps uh, people to learn how to read in the Hispanic community, and uh, that's to be definitely praised in today's fast-paced society. So thank you, Tony, for that. Then we get to this guy here. I've been waiting for you to be a judge. Justin Williams. He is the CEO of Affordable Limousine and Party Bus and also Progressive Properties. I met Justin when he was 19 years old. We started working on something that he already owned, which was Young Blood custom motorcycles, and he built that to be a powerhouse and a cash machine, and he was really admired by everybody in the motorcycle community for building custom motorcycles. He took all that talent and moved on to the limousine company, and even though that limousine 
industry has been around for a while. The difference with Justin is he saw things that could be better in that industry, and he wanted to seek to improve that service. And today, a premier limousine company is Affordable Limousines in West Michigan. And also, he owns the party bus business, which is the number one in the state of Michigan. Nobody uh, really has put together a party bus business like uh, Justin has. Uh, we were down at Grid 70, and we had a lot of people uh, from Amway and Steelcase and Wolverine Worldwide and Myers there. And I said, uh, said to Justin, hey, could you bring one of your buses? And all these executives came out. And from the outside, it looked nice. But they never wanted to leave the inside of the bus. It's just incredible what he's done with it, with the flat screen TVs and, and everything in there. Just, it's just uh, fantastic. Also, uh, Justin Williams is also very charitable. Justin gave of his time uh, for over a year to help us with at-risk youth uh, here in the inner city when we were teaching them innovative thinking and entrepreneurial mindset skills. And Justin came in and uh, actually lent one of his buses that he just bought and uh, working with the GRCC uh, designers and art crew here at Grand Rapids Community College, uh, put together a lot of drawings and, and, uh, and a portfolio to present to Justin and then Justin used some of those ideas. Uh, so that was a, a collaboration with Grand Rapids Public School System, Spectrum Health, and Amway, and Ottawa Hills uh, High School. Uh, Justin is, uh, all I get to say, he is a serial entrepreneur. Anything that he puts his mind to, and at a very young age, he's super successful. And again, he's a Grand Rapids uh, Community College alum. So again, if we could have a big round of applause for all three judges. All right. Now it's your turn. Your turn to shine, your turn to come up here. Let me put on my glasses. This is something that comes with age. So let me go ahead and put on my glasses here. And go to our very first presenter, Nicholas Hutchinson. Are you here, Nicholas? Okay, Nicholas Hutchinson, cleaning bag in box. There you go. Hello, my name is Nick Hutchison. I work at West Michigan Whitecaps and Van Andel Arena as a vending manager there. During the end of season cleanup at the ballpark, Pepsi comes in and does a year-end maintenance. And as they were doing their maintenance, I realized they never did the cleaning. And they don't clean, and it's not a standard procedure. I went into further investigation to make sure that it wasn't just this time somebody messed up. But it's actually true. It's not a standard procedure at all. And Thinking about it, I thought, well, we could put an organic liquid detergent inside the same exact program, which is their bag in a box that they put the syrup in, and then flush water through after you do the lines with the liquid detergent to make sure there's no detergent residue left over. Cleaning it not only will make it, you know, promote cleanliness and healthiness, but it will also prevent clogging and it will make sure that they, um, it also pre promote longer lifing, longer life in the lines. There are 102 fountain lines at West Michigan Whitecaps, and none of them are being cleaned. And after, this is our 20th season, and we've had to replace them multiple times, and it's just an expense that had, can be avoided completely. And being at the, seeing all the food industry and the FDA, and they always go after people after not being cleaned, I'm surprised that Pepsi hasn't gone after yet. And I think that, you know, if we promote this and make them and show them, you know, this will promote your lifelong, it'll promote the life of the lines. It will make sure that, you know, it'll promote cleanliness and people will become healthier. And not only do they own lines at ballparks, but they own it at every food venue. And it's not only Pepsi, it's Coke. And thank you for your attention and everything today. So. You're, you're telling me that they don't clean the lines out of these pop vending machines any place? <laughs> um, out of the two places that I work at, they have, I have not seen them clean the lines. They do that's, clean the outside parts. That's disgusting. I, th I think you have a great idea. Yeah. Questions? <clears throat> at the White Cup uh, Park, uh, did you figure out how much they would be in saving if they did use the detergent that you're suggesting? I looked into the cost of detergent and then the bag and the bags that we would have to put the soda lines in. And in the long run, it will definitely save money because you don't have to replace lines and pull the lines out. And sometimes it's at Whitecaps, there's 60 feet of line that you have to replace if they mess it up. And then besides that, just overall cleanliness and 
promoting health for other people. Is it a special detergent or something that you can get easily? Um, I've been looking into it a little bit, and I've been looking at GFS type of liquid detergent that they already have to promote and put it through there. So, okay. Good idea. Is this something that would be a cost that would be incurred by the White Caps or by Pepsi? Pepsi technically owns the lines that are within the White Caps, okay. and there are 102 of them. And so Pepsi comes in and does the year-end maintenance, and it's their own lines, and we just use them, and we buy the syrup. So it would be a Pepsi cost. Okay. Let's give another round of applause for Nicholas. All right, our next presenter, Jennifer Vanderplug, Art Market. Hi, my name is Jennifer Vanderplug, and um, I am an artist, but I also have a passion for business. Now, uh, I am a part-time working artist, and I've found it's a little bit difficult between work and school to, to really promote my work and for people to actually see it. I love to make it, it's hard to get it out there. I talk to a lot of other artists and they have a lot of the same problems, especially students coming out of school. Uh, they just don't have a lot of time or knowledge to get it out there. Uh, what I would like to do is uh, start a program that would collaborate between businesses and artists. Uh, the artists would um, sign their work up for the program and the program that I would like to call Art Market will place these uh, art pieces in different businesses all around Grand Rapids. So the businesses will benefit because uh, they will have the piece, and if they sell it, they will get a commission. They will also be paid by Art Market to have that piece in their, uh, in their lobby. Uh, the artists will benefit by having a lot of promotion because the, the artwork is going to be placed in a different, um, a different business each month. So it'll, it'll, it'll be mass exposure for the artists as well as helping the businesses uh, themselves to um, have a different interest, a different interesting uh, decoration in their lobbies. Uh, there are a lot of similar uh, decorations I see when I go to lobbies and things like that, and I like to see different and new, fresh experiences. This will also involve the community. Uh, we can have a website, something that people will be able to see and know and see if they can go on tours around the businesses around Michigan. So. Are there any questions? So the um, the business is, is kind of the um, <coughs> collecting art from various artists. So you, they, you need, obviously, a list of artists to, correct, to work with. Correct, correct. Yep, the artist would be funding um, art market, and the businesses will essentially act as galleries for the artist's work. Right, and, and so the, the business that displays the art actually uh, gets gets paid on a monthly right. some kind and that's of small the fee for displaying correct. the Correct. Yep, that's the incentive for the businesses and, because... And a commission if it's sold. Correct, and that will encourage the business to sell the piece while it's in their venue mm -hmm. as well. And, and the, the marketer, the art marketer, mm -hmm. obviously has to get a commission if these works are sold as well. Exactly, so part of it will go to art market. And I could see this also expanding to where we have employees that can have their, they can be agents, and they will have their set of artists that they need to market and try to find businesses that will be the best fit and promote um, to the community that comes to that business for that piece. So if I, if I understand it correctly, then you would have the artists create like uh, an advertisement for the business? Uh, yes, yep. The, uh, what I would like to do is have a matching, um, the business will have categories that they can choose according to what type of art they like or they think would sell in their venue. And the art, and we would be able to match an artist to that specific business to enhance their gallery and also to have the best uh, opportunity to sell it. Very good, thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jennifer. Our next presenter, Corey Gill, Teresa's Out of Shoes.
Hello, my name is Corey Gill. And according to the associates that work at shoe stores, 80% of shoes have um, creasing problems. And I have a um, iron, like a shoe iron, that will work similar to a, a, a regular iron, except for instead of blowing steam, it'll blow cool air once it gets to 133 degrees to iron out the shoes. It will come with like a support so the wrinkle will stay in place as you iron the shoe. And um, we, and the uh, bottom will be made out of metal. It'd be almost like an iron, it'd be almost like the, I mean, the bottom of an iron. Except for it's going to be one-fourth of the size of a ruler. And um, it will come with a spray bottle for water to cool the shoe down. And the reason why it would be 133 degrees, because um, polyester burns at over 148 degrees. So I was thinking 133 degrees, then it will cool down so it won't burn any material out of it. And basically, I will market this to um, shoe stores and uh, people that sell high-end shoes. Yeah. And I was thinking... So have you actually used one of these shoe irons? I mean, does it really take creases out of shoes? I believe so because um, I haven't actually created, I mean, made a shoe iron yet. But where I look on YouTube, what I see on people getting creases out is a regular iron out of their shoes. And it, oh. it works if you actually put like um, something on it to protect the shoe. And I was thinking it would be way too hot to actually get up to an iron temperature. So I was thinking 133 degrees should be good because it give a wiggle room because since the polyester thing burns down 140, over 148 degrees. Yeah, I've, wrinkles in shoes is what makes them look old, right? Yes. <laughs> Just leather shoes, then that you're thinking about removing the creases out. Now I'm thinking about universal for every material. Oh, material. Okay. And how? how <coughs> what makes you think that uh, the shoe store would buy something like that? Because I pitched it to Foot Locker, and the manager want to hear more. <laughs> okay, great. <laughs> Real world experience. <laughs> Do you think it'd be a product that would be? affordable for the individual to be able to purchase to do their own shoes or be more something just targeted towards, you know, shoe stores who are going to be dealing in a lot of volume? I believe it would be like a, more like a luxury item for like shoe fanatics. People have 33 plus shoes. Sure. Very good. Another round of applause. Excellent job. Our next uh, presenter, Albert Gardner, Auto Progress Board. Hello, my name is uh, Jack Gardner. Thank everyone for coming today. Um, so my proposal is um, uh, automotive information system in an automotive service garage. So um, the problem is, is you take your car to a garage and you're really not sure like uh, what the repair is or how long it's going to take. So um, with the information board, the technician can quickly um, point, click, and enter a couple of times, you know, and update the uh, uh, customer's information. And so um, the information board is quite similar to a, um, a hospital board. And like uh, if somebody goes in for surgery, you have it's all color coded for uh, the, the the level of service. So like you have um, white is uh, <coughs> the um, the the waiting time, and then yellow would be your um, uh, pre-service, like a pre-operate pre-operation, and then um, that would be your like 24-point uh, inspection and um, your uh, estimated time and cost, and then um, red would be like your surgery, and that would be like uh, 
or that would be your red would be your service would be like equivalent to a surgery, and that would be your like a uh, time on repair, and then orange would be um, <coughs> the uh, orange would be the uh, like your curing time, like um, recovery time, and then um, of course after that then it would go to green and then that would mean your car was ready to be picked up because it's done, and then uh, the customer can quickly get this on. Um, the uh, the internet by their iPhone tablet or computer, and then um, that will make uh, the customers more informed, and then that will make uh, innovative garages more ethical. Thank you. In your researches, have you seen any other products like this where garages are using technology to be able to communicate with their customers, or is this something that'd be brand new? No, this um, I would actually work with the uh, the software developer to make this, so it would be uh, something that would be new to make it uh, more of an interaction between the customer and the garage. Because um, I've seen like um, basic uh, data entry programs that um, you know you use in like uh, the, the auto garages and um, tire places, and um, they don't have anything that's gonna like really interact where the customer can just simply use their internet connection and then be able to find out what's going on. Would it also be a program that would allow further communication with the customer as far as reminders when your service dates are coming up or to allow a customer to schedule appointments? Yes. Or would it just be to notify you when your, old, your car is there? No, exactly. It would be um, to allow to uh, other times of information that you can contact them. So it would be like a re relationship management software for yes. auto service? Yes. Okay. <coughs> I think this is a good idea. Of course, uh, you're talking about a program that would run like in a PC or a Ma uh, an Apple. Yes, the, I the idea would be like if you had a four-star, uh, four-stall four garage, that each uh, port, each stall of the garage would have a computer, so the technician can go and then update that. And then the customer can access that information via their cellular phone. Yeah, it would be. So like it'll be interactive. Yeah, so they could just jump on, like, say, the uh, the website, and then they could just scroll to, like, service, and then they would just, um, on there would be, like, an information board with the customers, each customer's name, and then it would be the color to the level of service of where their car is at in the progress. So why do you think a company would want to have a, an application like that? Because uh, I thought of it for my own service garage, so I'm so going to incorporate it to be more. to satisfy the customer? Is that the end goal? Yeah. Is to keep them informed. And in that, you think the, co the company or the business will generate more customers to come in into their garage? Yeah, Is exactly. That the idea? Yeah, if I, if you interact with them more, so they they have more of an idea of um, exactly what is going on, instead of just looking at an invoice and then it's popped down two, three, four hundred dollars, yeah. they don't know exactly where that yeah. cost is going. That's so a then, good idea. Yeah, yeah this Thank will be more ethical and provide more information for the consumer. One of the things that we try to do at Grand Rapids Community College for all of our students is to do more than just uh, the professor in the classroom, but to give them outside experiences. Uh, so the idea pitch competition that happens in the fall, we hope for the business plan competition in the spring, and of course the internships, and, and really give them as much real world experience in solving problems. So again, it takes a lot of courage to come up here and give those ideas. We're off to a great start. I'd also like to uh, acknowledge our Vice President of Communications, Raul Alvarez, who's all the way in the back. If I get a round of applause for him. <laughs> He's being nice enough today to uh, bring his camera so that we can get some great pictures and that. But Raul and Melinda Powers behind the scenes have done a great job. It really takes a uh, team effort uh, at this college to get things done. Uh, so it's a collaboration of the professors, the staff, and also uh, with the students. So again, thank you very much, Raul, for all your wonderful help and for Melinda as well. All right, moving on to our next idea. Can't, can't wait. Can't wait here. Carrie Curtis, Leanne Brown, the self-adjusting bra. I'm a little nervous. <laughs> Hi, I'm Carrie Curtis, and this is Leanne Brown, and we came up with an idea um, that will make 
every woman's life a little bit easier and also give them confidence that a lot of people look to surgery for for uncomfortable measures. Let me just say this. We developed a product that is a um, bra, <laughs> and above, <laughs> sorry, above the underwear is a empty air sac. And opposed to using uncomfortable padding or chicken cutlets, I don't know if anybody's familiar with those, but they're horrible. There is an inside pump that you can pump and adjust. And I think that, unfortunately, not every woman is born with the most beautiful breasts in the world. And some suffer from one having one larger than the other. So that was an easy solution for them to be able to wear the clothes that are in style and make them not feel insecure about the way they look. And also for women who suffer from breast cancer and went through biopsies that has altered their image, give them more of a sense of confidence without having to stuff or worry about something falling. Or for the average woman who wants to use it for a special occasion and wants to have a little extra cleavage, or just in order to wear all the beautiful clothes that they're making <laughs> right now. I timed that pretty good, huh? Yeah. <laughs> So have you actually built one of these? Well, the concept is actually, I we think it's really genius. And a lot of our girlfriends and women that we've talked to are like, I want one right now. Um, I don't remember if any of you remembered like the high top pumps from the 90s with the basketball and you yeah, yeah. pump it up. It's a similar concept, okay. but it will be on the inside. So it's not visible. And it's also will be convenient because you can deflate it before you wash it or clean it. And I think that with all the different bra options that they have, there's just none that you can adjust. It just it is what it is, or you have to custom order. Mm -hmm. So this will give women the chance to alter their appearance or just feel comfortable in their own clothes. But it's that same basic concept. Does yeah, so <laughs> does this adjust the straps or just the cup itself? Just the cup size. Have you um, looked into how much cost this would add to, to a bra? <laughs> well, actually, I you know what? I think it would be very reasonable considering um, if you look at all the different lines of bras that Victoria's Secret or just any department store offers, um, you they already offer the air bras and the water bras, and they're roughly around 49 99 to 55 dollars so it's the basic concept same thing so I can't imagine that it would be that much more to incorporate something so simple as opposed to just doing it pre-made yeah I know they're pretty pricey. yeah yeah tell me about it <laughs> so, so just hold on so if it, it would roughly would be about 55 dollars for roughly for yeah and so you you did indicate that this would have also a kind of a medical application for those that have gone through. Absolutely. You know, women who go through something so traumatic as that, I, I think that it, there's just nothing worse than, you know, going through and surviving through that and having a visual reminder, you know. And people, girls want to dress up and look nice. They want to wear fashionable things and not worry about is something going to fall out or slide down or just... No, your market would be for the Victoria's Secret, or you would also sell it for all women, Sears? everybody. So you you will stress it for Victoria's Secret. You think you'll be able to convince them? I I don't know. I hope I hope I can convince you guys. It'll give me a okay, nice okay, little so jump start. Okay, very good. <laughs> very good. Very good. As far as the pump mechanism, have you guys actually worked on the design for that, or it's just more in the idea stage still? Um, it's more in the idea stage, but I have a very good idea of how it would be designed and where I want to go with, where we would like to go with it. Um, I've been a sucker. I own a water bra, an air bra. Okay. One of the one of the thoughts that I have, as far as you know, the pump mechanism. A lot of time they're they're not extremely small. Like when you're talking about your example from the old yes. shoe. Now, if you're going to be wearing it, you know, along the side here, and a lot of times when women like to wear something that is tight fitting, mm -hmm. you know, is it going to be able to be slender enough to, so it's not exposed? Absolutely. Not it would be on the inside, mm -hmm. about the, a little smaller than a quarter. Okay. 
And it, I mean, there would be uh, obviously the pump, mm -hmm. but it would be inside against the skin and flush with the outside of the bra. Okay, and also the, the plastic part that would be inflating, mm -hmm. um, would that be able, to, is there a product that you've looked at that would be able to withstand going through a washing machine? Um, you know, something that would stay flexible and not have yes. to give it heat the, um, the air bra that I own, I took it apart and it's fine to be washed and they looked at it, and the only difference between the ones that are already on the market and this one would be the pump and the fact that, this is kind of silly, but when we came up with the idea, it was kind of a concept of like tss, 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 but the noise helps, and then you, before you would wash it to care for it, you would just deflate it. Okay. So the current ones come already inflated? Yes. So not an issue with washing? Absolutely. Good, very good. Is Heather here with us? Is Heather Mary? No? Okay. Uh, Heather, let's, I do want to acknowledge her because uh, she was one of the 15 finalists, and we hope that everything's fine. Heather McDonoghue and Grand Rapids Brew Bus. Okay. So we were really looking forward to, to hearing about that. Uh, our next presenter, uh, Shana Mendendorp. And her idea is giving a helping hand. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for coming. The heart is one of the most important parts of the body. Giving a helping hand will create uh, homemade items ranging from jewelry to hats and scarves. I hope to sell these items either online or at different sorts of craft stores or word of mouth. Then I hope to give a percentage of the portion, a portion of the profits to an organization, either similar or the American Heart Association. The American Heart Association has saved many lives and also inspired people to become healthier. I propose uh, three of my grandparents have had heart conditions. And so, and they were saved by a similar organization or the American Heart Association. I want to inspire people to organize or make products along with me to either and then sell the products to others. When people look in the when people who have either made the product or have bought in and, and looked at their, in their homes will see that they've made a difference in a person's life or they saved a life. Now, I have done something like this before. Uh, and so, will you help me uh, make a difference in a person's life? Thank you for your time. I was just wondering if <clears throat> you, you, you kind of said make products. I was just wondering if you had anything more specific in mind. Uh, items, uh, homemade jewelry. Uh, when I had said I've made something myself, I um, helped an organization called The Doc, the Discipling of Christ Kids, and I sold the jewelry I made, and I helped to raise money to expand their organization. The, it would be blankets that were made by hand uh, and hats and scarves or different sorts of crafts, like a handbag or something. So, so as, as, as a business, the organization making the products has to make some kind of return. Oh, I'm sorry. I misspoke. <laughs> it would be made by me and other volunteers. I was a little bit nervous. <laughs> he was wrong word. <laughs> I, I think the idea is great, and, and I like the name, Giving a Helping Hand. Now, I do know that there are other people out there doing the same thing, so you'll have to do quite a bit of competition to achieve that. I, I've seen it done for international, uh, doing blankets for kids in Honduras, for example. 
Mm -hmm. So how do you, how do you expect to compete with those people that are already doing it? I hope to compete uh, with the internet. Use the internet. Uh, to attract volunteers. Yes, and then also make the items unique. I have had many people ask to have bracelets, blankets, and stuff. I've I've not made the blankets myself. No but like different sorts of quilts and stuff and that's attractive people like, ooh, I want that. And so what it would be would be uh, the fact of the or, uh, profits would go to an organization like the American Red Cross or something. And I believe that would inspire the people. Would it be a type of situation where it might have a actual product line where I could go online and I could pick from, you know, a design that I like, or I could submit something and say, I like this blanket, but I would like, you know, this and this and this done to it, or start customizing it to make it more desirable, or is it more of a, you know, whatever the, the volunteers want to make, and you just go into the situation, seeing it's the, I guess, you know, would it be able to tailor to a specific person's life? Yes, it would be tailored. Um, I'm a business student myself, and so I understand that the customer's needs come first. So, yes, it would be, or tried it best. So I've also contacted uh, the American Heart Association, Association, and I'm waiting to hear from them back. And I also have a partner I'm hopefully going to be hearing back from as well. Right. Our next presenter, Austin McKee, with his idea, CareView. Good evening, everybody. I'm Austin McKee. Uh, I'd like to thank everybody for coming out to listen to my idea, CareView. Um, how many parents I got out here today? All right. Thank you. Um, when you have your child in a in a daycare center. Um, what you want is peace of mind. You're, you're looking for peace of mind in the fact that your child is going to receive the greatest care possible. Um, I, I feel that ca daycare centers don't do a great job with communicating the parents that they have in their centers. Um, the solution I see is CareView. CareView is a mobile as well as uh, web-based application that will bridge the gap between parents as well as the child care professionals. Uh, CareView arms the child care professionals with the tools they need to uh, the tools that are uh, that they need to um, wow the tools that they need to have a, a more efficient job as well as um, put their daycare in a leading edge over other daycares. Um, CareView will use tools such as uh, online scheduling systems for the uh, child care providers as well as a mobile check-in check-out system that they can use. Um, other features that, they, that CareView will sustain for the parents uh, will be such as um, a real-time snapshot of what their child is doing in the, in the daycare and, and so on. This is a highway that will bridge the gap between parents as well as the child care provider. Thank you. For the mobile check-in, check-out application, could you explain a little bit more about that? What would the benefit be to me as a parent? The, the benefit for you as a parent would be the ease that you know that your child is, you know, you instead of, I've, I've chatted with um, different daycare facilities, and they have a system where they punch in a code, and they uh, check in their child that way. If you could do it through a device that you have, you know, online signature, some kind of program that sort, um, it would integrate your technology with the safety of your child. Would that be different than when I bring my child to the daycare and check in in person? Is it more of a something that might alert me if someone was to pick my child up? And exactly. That's just a feature that would be added on as a side note. Um, yeah. <coughs> so you're also talking about like real-time videos of your child in the daycare being able to uh, 
at any point in the day see what's what's going on with them? Is, is that part of the concept? Yes. Uh, some daycares already implement a video camera surveillance system that their parents can log on to. This, this system would implement it for them as well as the daycares that don't have the budget to implement a surveillance system, such as it will work off of the scheduling system that the child care professional inputs into the system. And the parent can look on their you know, mobile device and it has a real time snapshot you know, of what the schedule said that they were gonna be doing at this time, such as you know, snap, snack time, apple slices, what they're eating today. And just s things like that. Okay. So your, uh, your primary market for this obviously would be the, the uh, daycare provider. Mm -hmm. facilities. Yeah, yep. Uh, I would think that this would, like I said, give them the leading, leading edge over daycare centers. Um, in Caledonia, where I live, they have Milestone as well as Adventures Daycare across the street. Um, I would like to see one of them, you know, take this idea and give them an edge over the other daycare center. If, you know, parents would go to this daycare center because they have this system. I was going to ask you if you have looked into what it would cost to create this program if it's going to be web-based. I, I have not, no. The, what do you think? I, w I want to do more market research to the actual parents as well as a child care uh, professional s to see what kind of features they would want specifically, and then off of that, um, I would build a price. I've, I've been working with uh, UX Design out of Grand Rapids to try to implement this idea. Are we ready for that idea that most of the um, – Daycare centers do have computers? Uh, sorry, I didn't hear the question. Are most of the daycare centers that you're familiar with, do they have computers? Do they have that capability? I believe that they do. The, the, the ones I did uh, had that to their option, but um, I'm thinking for farther down the road when technology is more, you know, uh, implemented in these daycares, this system can really jumpstart them into using their technology for, to the fullest potential. Is Hope with us today? Hope wasn't feeling very well. Uh, we were looking forward to her idea. Uh, she proposed an idea, and it was titled Youth for Abstinence. Uh, the next presenter, Andrew. Andrew Harker. Is Andrew here? You know, we hope that with some of our presenters that did make it to the finalist, you know, we were hoping that they would be here, but we hope that nothing wrong has happened to them, so let's make sure to keep them in our thoughts. The very next presenter, Carl, I don't know if this is true, but Carl told me that, you know, we had the Summer Olympics this year, and he said that this uh, next um, idea that he had possibly could be considered by the next Summer Olympics as an official event. Uh, Carl Nykstrom is custom beer pong. <laughs> Think about that for a college, college students that come from How does that happen? <laughs> they have leaks. There we go. Uh, so, if I go out on the weekends or I do anything, and I don't know some people at the party, first thing I do is I like to go do some something entertaining. I'll grab a friend and I'll be like, hey, you want to play some beer pong? Simple. Of course the answer is yes. Um, like, I've seen anywhere from like a table like this right here to a fantastic table at a buddy's house that I made for him. Absolutely hands down. I'll say they throw the best parties. The beer pong table just has people lined up. If you walk into uh, like Grand Valley, Michigan State, Western, Central, they all party. <laughs> Every single person parties. Everybody knows that. That's what they're known for. And they all throw like huge bashers. I've been to a few. They're pretty cool. But I stick to beer pong. It's my game. I like it. It's fun. The idea of it is you have eight foot long table or a six foot long table, your choice, 27 inches wide, about five inches deep. In between the table, like we'll put plexiglass on the top of this. This will be filled with nothing but air. And then another layer would be this. And inside of it, you could have your favorite alcohol bottle. 
Mine would be Grey Goose. You put Grey Goose bottles lining the top to the bottom of the board, and then fill it with highlighter mix. Oh, yeah, fill it up. <laughs> Make it sweet. Maybe it's because I'm so old, but what is beer pong? <laughs> you got ten cups. You line four up, three up, two up, one. So it's a triangle. It's it's very popular right now. And uh, you have uh, ping pong balls, basically. And both sides have ten cups and do a triangle. Objective is to make them. You make the cups, you pull the cups after you're you and your partner choose, and then it continues on. There's different, there's different like things you can do. Like three, two, one, and you get down to that. A zipper is three this way, and two right here. You can do around this. There's different like patterns you can do for it. That was fun. <laughs> Carl, so, so how are you going to make money here? I mean, I'm I'm trying to. Are you going to sell the idea? Is it something that you would like to do? Or? I like to do it just because I like the board games. I like the ping pong games. I like the board games. So um, it can get people to want to play chess. Like the uh, beer pong table I have up on this end right here. It's pretty sweet. It's the uh, Grey Goose bottles lined on the top. Okay. And that's the table. And you just put your cards and then you put whatever you're holding on the cups and you just play. And then like when you ask, oh, what's the difference? So, so the environment is also you ha it's kind of a party environment kind of a thing. You have to have a party environment in order to you for it to succeed. You can have the party environment, but some people just like to chill and like have their beer and then they're done. Okay. Whereas some people are very chill during the day and like to play chess and have fun. Okay. Thanks. You know, I think it's a pretty decent idea. One of the things that you have to consider in business is if you're going to be marketing to colleges, and obviously there's uh, thousands of colleges nationwide, um, you know, let's say best case scenario, suddenly everybody wants one. You're looking at building these yourself. What would you do for the next step if suddenly you post this online and tomorrow you've got 187 orders that need to be filled? All right, we're good. So he owns his own business, has his own warehouse, does his own manufacturing and everything. The boards would be easy. I can order that standard from a lumber thing, plus my dad gets it free with all of his businesses. And then he has a workshop. All I'd have to do is cut the boards, continuously running them. And then on top of that, I have plenty of, like, I could hire people. That'd be easy enough. And then... Like the online thing, the only thing I would worry about is what they would want in it. Because if they wanted beer bottles in it or something, like beer bottles wouldn't be too hard to get, but like a Grey Goose bottle or something, you're looking at, I think it, if per fifth, it's about 35, 39 bucks. So that'd be pretty expensive to try and get those. But overall, I wouldn't be too worried about it, just based on how many I can run out per hour. Now, when you talk about with the Grey Goose bottles being $39, piece, are you anticipating actually putting these in their full? No, no, them? definitely oh. not. You can, like, put, most people, like, will put, like, a highlighter mix in it, and then what you can do is you can put, like, a black light around the side, right. light them up. Okay. Thank you very much, Carl. Our next presenter, Jeffrey Knoll, Book Hippie is his idea. Tell us about Book Hippie. That, that, that's okay. There you go, sir. Thank you for your time, consideration of my idea. My idea is called Book Hippie. My idea stems from a research study that was done by the government 
Accountability Office. It said that from 1986 to 2004, textbooks increased in price 240%. We're seeing textbooks that cost two, three hundred dollars, and we have across all the campuses in the United States, we see a monopoly starting to be built. Where the on-campus bookstores, there's really no alternative for people that have like financial aid, or maybe their parents are paying for it or whatever. So my idea, it helps solve that issue. What it is, it's an online site that allows students to register books that they have from classes they've already taken. Then, through a matchmaking system, pairs them up with other students that have completed the courses they're going into. So let's say Political Science 101 is a class that I've completed, but I'm going into English 101. What this does is it finds another student that is going into Poli Sci 101 and has completed English 101, and it match makes us. So that way we can trade our books instead of going to the bookstore and spending two, three hundred dollars. At the next level, let's say I have a book that I can't trade. Book Hippie will buy this book from the student and then list it on somewhat of an auction site. What this does is that when a student purchases it, the book from a different college, it allows them, <laughs> it allows them to basically send that book anonymously to that other student and receive compensation from Book Hippie. Have you looked at all into the software side of it as far as the development, what kind of costs would be involved? Well, actually, I'm a web developer here. Um, I've actually completed the entire site. It is functional. It's ready for launch. Um, the e-commerce is still something that has to be decided. Do we want it to go through PayPal? Do we want to try something like Nelnet? Maybe or do our own thing? It's completely up in the air right now, but we do have the website ready to go. What kind of guarantee would I have as a student when I put my book in the mail? I haven't received the other one yet. Um, my book disappears. I never received it. Now I've got a $200 textbook that I just mailed away. I've actually, um, I've actually had somebody ask this question before, and we do have this built into the marketing plan. Um, what it does is that this list basically doesn't purchase anything until there is a buyer. So once we connect a buyer with a seller, then what it does is it purchases that book. This person that bought the book basically puts it into this escrow account. It sits there until they receive it on their end. If within a week, two weeks, we have a, um, you know how they, they print out those pre-postage for UPS with the tracking device? Um, basically what we do is that when it goes from one person to the other, the seller of the book prints off the label and we track it on our end. So when we see something had arrived, then we send them three emails over three days and saying, hey, you received your book, how do you like it? Does it work, is it good? If they don't respond within the three days, the compensation is sent to the seller, the buyer is assumed to have the book, and that's the end of that. So is there a, uh, a, a commission for doing these, these book trades? Well, the book trades I'm thinking is gonna be a dollar, but if it goes onto the listing auction site, you know when you go to Amazon, they say we have 44 from $3.93. Um, it looks kind of like that, where that top number is actually going to be the lowest seller. So let's say somebody says they want to sell their book for five bucks, and everything is above five bucks. We're only going to display that we have a book for five dollars. And what it's going to do is that when the purchase is made, then that's when the book is sent. Um, so then what we do is that the algorithm that's been written basically rounds up to the nearest dollar, and then adds a dollar. So you pay a flat rate. So you see, let's say somebody set, listed their book for 458. On the other end, the, purchase, the person that's purchasing the book is gonna see this book is for sale for $6. We're buying it from this person for 458, so we profit $1.42 to make this happen. Obviously we got shipping costs, so it'll be, it'll be factored into the algorithm. I think it's a very good idea. It reminded me when I first came here to college. After each semester, the library would, would, would have something like this in which everyone brought in their books, their used books, and then that's where the matching occurred. So I think there's a big need for this and it's, it's a good thing for the students. Uh, so I, I really like the idea. Would you also limit the, the, the price of the book before you accept a book to come in because I notice you complain about the prices 
of it being two hundred, three hundred dollars. Well, that's the beauty about this. When people list their books online, they're competing with other people with that book. If you don't list yours at a reasonable price, you'll never sell that book. At the same time, if you think about it, we go to the, the bookstore and we sell our books for twenty bucks when we paid two hundred. People are gonna see there's a rational there's a there's a price I'm willing to pay. And so they'll see, okay, this book is twenty bucks. I can sell my book for twenty bucks at the bookstore, or I can go on Book Hippie and sell my book for sixty bucks, which is a fair value because I paid two hundred. So there's gonna be there's gonna be an equitable value there for both the seller and the buyer so, to pay so less. You won't, you won't have any limit then. You're gonna go whatever whatever the demand is then. Yep, exactly. Okay. The demand and the supply. Now the other question I had is why hippie? Why why book hippie? Well, actually it came from a very creative idea. Um we could we thought about Google Plus. Um, you know how everybody has their little circles. Um, community colleges, Grand Valley, Davenport, those are going to be circles, but they're going to be in bigger circles and then bigger circles. And so we kind of thought about, oh, there's all these hippies are, you know, trading one thing for another and these circles, we call them the hippie circles. Um, and I just thought it was a cute idea, you know. Have you put any thought into having different um, categories, different grades of a specific book as far as the value? If I look at a, a math textbook, <coughs> then it's beat up versus mid-quality versus a high-quality and having different price points at that. Well, I wouldn't even say with the price points because it all depends on who the person, the person that bought that book is going to determine, is this going to be acceptable for me to use in my classes? If within that three days they say, no, this is not the book that I need or this book is way too damaged for me to use, Within those three days, those three emails, they click no, prints out a return shipping label, they send it right back to the seller. I guess my question beyond that is, um, you know, you say you're going to show whatever the best price book is. You've got one of these books available for five dollars, so you're going to say we have this book available for five dollars. But you know, if I'm going on there and if there's a consistent problem with hearing about my friends have ordered books and they come, they show up and they're in rough condition. You know, would it be maybe advantageous where you could say, well, we have a an A, a B, and a C quality book, and one's available for this price. You know, we've got five, we've got ten, and we've got twenty-five dollars. You know, and we've got the three different categories. So. Yeah, that is actually a pretty good idea to make like a, a star rating system. Yeah. Um, you could even do that based on the seller, um, the person that's selling the books. They're going to be reviewed by the people that are buying their books. Right. Kind of like with eBay, where we have forty people that said great, but this one person said this this book was terrible. I guess not necessarily rating the books, but more so who's selling the books. And that, and that could be one of my thoughts was on uh, the grading system would be similar to like on an auto trader where you go on there and you, you know, look at, you know, good condition, poor condition, you know, excellent condition. You can look at your book and go, well, you know, yeah, my cover's a bit tattered and I've got some torn pages. So this one then qualifies as a B rated book and mm. then, you know, go into that category. Yeah. Um, I didn't specifically implement that into the web design itself, but... Speaking about it here, it's entirely possible. The algorithm is very easily changed to where the buyers and the sellers can add any type of attributes to their to their names or even for the product they're selling because it's all through e-commerce. Excellent job. For the entrepreneur, it takes uh, the support of family and friends. Uh, you're hearing a lot of great ideas today, whether we go through the history books and we take a look at such names as Vanderbilt, Scott, Rockefeller, Ford, Carnegie, or we take a look at the new names, uh, Jobs, Gates, uh, Sergey Brin and Larry Page, or Mark Zuckerberg. If you go back through the history, you find out that they had a lot of different ideas and they tried a lot of different things. One of the things that uh, we propose is that you go through various iterations and then you land on that one big idea. So again, a lot of courage to step forward with these ideas. Uh, Richard DeVos, we had some time. Uh, to spend with him a few summers ago, the students here at GRCC, in fact, the three generations of the DeVos family. And what we really enjoyed and valued was when Mr. DeVos went through all the businesses that him and Mr. Van Andel started uh, that didn't work, uh, leading up to, finally, uh, the creation of Amway. And if you listen to all those stories of trying and success and failure and then having the courage to get up again, uh, it's just fascinating. So again, uh, we never know. We might have the next uh, Steve Jobs uh, or Larry Brin right here in our audience and presenting with us today. 
So again, thank you very much. The other thing I'd like to do is also thank all the faculty at Grand Rapids Community College. Uh, we believe at Grand Rapids Community College that we have a university quality experience for our students, yet at a community college price, which really is an excellent value proposition that can't be found uh, elsewhere, anywhere in the United States that we see. Uh, we only recruit the very best of faculty and the very best of staff here uh, to uh, help grow our economy through you, uh, the students. Our future is with you. I'd like to also acknowledge um, the former business department head, Professor Glenn Gelderloos, uh, who's uh, at the back there. Thank you very much for coming with us. If we could have a round of applause for him, please. <laughs> I, I grow every day in appreciation of what a department head goes through. Uh, and uh, I should have been much nicer to you, Glenn, through all, those, through, you, through all those years. You did a wonderful job. Thank you very much for everything you did for our department. And we have a Steven Spielberg at Grand Rapids Community College. We don't know what we would do with him. He's helped us produce a lot of film. Uh, today's idea pitch, the 2012 idea pitch, will be on the Grand Rapids Community College YouTube channel. And in fact, you could see the 2011 and the 2010. You could find that on our business department uh, homepage, so please visit it. And we have many videos, and that's Class Quant and his wonderful crew of filmmakers here at Grand Rapids Community College. If we could have a very special warm applause for him. <laughs> it, it's just amazing. It's just really amazing what, what, he, what he can do. Uh, thank you for staying with us and not going to Hollywood. All right, uh, next up, um, Damien, Hardin, Glow, and Walk. Damien, share with us your idea. Hello, everybody. Damien Hardin. Um, how many of us drive at night? I'm sure everybody in here drives at night. I'm sure everybody need, at least knows one person that owns a dog. Well, put those two in a scenario for you. Say, how many times have anybody ever been driving up down a city or a rural street and boom, out of nowhere, a pedestrian and their pet are like two or three car lengths from being made a hood ornament. Um, I have a simple solution for helping people see these animals at night. It's called the glowing walk, AKA Duke Nightwalker. It is a leash and harness combo made of LED lights and uh, the characteristics, the neon characteristics of deep sea creatures known as bioluminescence. The harness lights will promote safety and awareness and also it will help visibility of these pedestrians and their pets at night. Um, the idea came to me when I actually, uh, probably 20 minutes before our, the deadline for this pitch, and I almost hit somebody and it almost, it, 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 it's a real thing to almost hit a, a pedestrian and their pet and it's a very it's a very big life changer. So, I think that this will promote safety and help uh, help people who have to walk their dogs after dusk. Because sometimes people have to walk after night. Um, glow and walk. Thank you. How would you plan on uh, raising awareness about your product? Um, actually, uh, just come up with a clever marketing scheme if. You produce the item, um, only give it to a certain amount of a, a, a fixed group of people, maybe 25, and have them walk their dog. And I'm pretty sure that it, from seeing this, it's, it's, a, it's a cool idea. And I'm pretty sure that other people will want to know where did you get this idea from or, or where did you get the item from. And I think that with the way trends are, everybody's trying to be the next trend trendsetter, um, I think that this would be a good idea. Now you mentioned um, LED lighting as well as, as, well as bioluminescence. Um, how did you plan on integrating the bioluminescence or, or what would the purpose of that be versus the LED or would they work together? Uh, I think uh, that would be the patent strong point with the bioluminescence from the deep sea creatures. It would, it would make it different from just the LED lights or the microfiber, I mean the fiber optics and things like that you have today. Now, these LEDs, are you using batteries or, I mean, how are you going to energize them? Or? Oh, th well, I, I think a, a lot of research needs to be done by um, marine biologists and things like of that sort, but 
mainly I think the the most thing I think would be double A batteries, but keep it away from the pet and closer to the pedestrian so it'll be pet safe. Both people, both persons are uh, including the animal as well as the person would have to wear this? No, no, it's just, it's a, it's a leash and harness combo, just the harness and the leash for the dog. Okay. Thank you. Uh, back to my one of the original questions with the bioluminescence and the LEDs. Um, you know, it sounds like when you're saying you need to talk to a marine biologist and do research on it, on this, it sounds like a Just to make it pet safe. Okay, to make it pet safe. A couple of things that popped in my mind is, um, would you be actually be extracting um, something from the marine creatures to be able to put into your No, product? just the just the characteristics of okay, those. Just, just the characteristics, the characteristics okay. yes. Because that's what I was going to say. So, you know, a lot of times uh, people who are pet owners wouldn't want anything with an animal. Yeah, product. yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. where you've harmed an animal. Most definitely. Just the characteristics it. of the bright glow in okay. the dark. I uh, uh, almost want to be reminiscent of the Luke, Luke Skywalker lightsaber. Just the, the glowing capabilities of that. Excellent. Our next presenter with the idea Hollywood Styles for Less, a welcome applause for Ashley Calvert. Good evening, everybody. How is everybody doing? Now, I know everybody look at celebrities and I like, oh, look at Kim Kardashian here or Lala, Anthony or um, Beyonce. I know, ladies, I know you wonder like, oh, my gosh, their hair is so beautiful. I wish my hair was like that. But I bet it costs a fortune. Well, with my business feature, Hollywood Looks for Less, you can get that. You can get that style at everyday people prices. This salon would be a express express natural hair care services to ex to add extensions to the hair by either braiding or weaving. Now hair hair extensions is not a, is not anything new. Women have been wearing them for years, obviously wigs and things of that nature. So just adding convenience and price to this particular items would make this business unique. Now most salons uh, charge um, to apply into the extensions into the hair, it ranges from $120 to $200. And in the process to insert them, it can go all the way up from three or more hours. With this, with my particular Hollywood Looks for Less, it would um, cut price down at prices starting at $50 and uh, make it maximum time to be two hours, depending on the client and hairstyle desired, obviously. But we would just go for two hours. Um, Let's see. Um, so yeah, um, just with that, just adding those two things in there, that would you know either it's time and convenience. As you know, ladies will spend money on you know making enhancing their beauty. So confidence is the best accessory. So adding new hairstyle will make everything want want the Hollywood look for less. Is there something about your product and the technique that you would be using that would allow you to greatly reduce the cost of doing the process, or is it that you'd just be cutting your profit margins compared to what people are normally used actually, to? Actually, that's something I didn't get to hit. Um, actually, in order to cut the process, um, you would put it into a dual. It's a dual process. You have a person called a braider that would braid the hair into the, into the pattern, to whatever the, the, the style um, the client would like. Um, with that, that can cut down time. I know I have a friend that can braid somebody's hair, just braiding it in a basic pattern in 30 minutes. And then you would have somebody call the stylist, which would weave the hair in, apply it with the needle and thread, and then they go from there. So you make it a dual pro pro process, and also learning to the correct techniques to put, to insert it in the certain patterns to make it efficient and time efficient and to have it come out nice as well. So you're cutting down on the time that it takes, but in essence, you're also doubling the staff that it takes to do it by having two people do the process instead of one. Um, is there still going to be a, a cost savings there, or is there going to be enough profit left over? Um, actually, there has been different pr uh, prototypes of shops like this that are very successful, um, very, very successful. Um, there is, for instance, there's a shop I know of, 
I used to personally drive from Grand Rapids to go down to Detroit to go get my hair down, my hair done. And like I said, if you like particular shops here in Grand Rapids, if you go and ask, you're going to charge me two hundred dollars. Of course, that with that particular price range that you're offering, you're going to get more people, you know, because. Oh, I can afford fifty, sixty dollars to get it in versus the two hundred. Oh, girl, where you get your hair? Oh, I went to the, I, you know, you know that can bring in, especially with particular service. You can either do like a walk-in service with that type of. I think with the with that price point <laughs> and having two people, obviously with the stylist, um, I had put in the plan. They would get the braiders since it's so basic. They wouldn't get paid as much as the stylist off, obviously, because they're not doing as much work. Um, and actually, in Michigan, you do not have to have a license to do this type of work because it's chem there's no chemicals. So that cuts down a lot of price in general. You don't have somebody who's got to pay to go to school to do these particular services. You know, you, more people braiding and threading and learning technique is, you know, it's more efficient and more people can do this. And I think it's a great idea. I just want to make sure you don't undercut yourself. There's right. such a huge difference between what the market is currently supporting and what you're offering. You know, doing a lot of volume is a great thing, but, you know, uh, make sure the money's there for it. Right. you were going <coughs> to reduce the cost is because of your dual process. Um, now your audience or your client, is it pretty much a broad clientele or is it specific to a given type of hairstyle? It will be broad. It will be broad. Um, obviously, the something I'm similar to what I'm speaking of is something I have on my head right now. It's um, You would normally braid the hair. Um, it could be corn, corn rolls or in a circle French braids. And then you will normally buy hair. It comes like on a track. Some there's other type of there's different type of uh, ways you can actually put extensions into hair. They have thing called fusion. That's with glue. Um, they have a lot of different, a um, lot of different type of styles, a uh, lot of different techniques how you can insert the, the particular thing. Um, most hair types use the same type of hair, but obviously we wouldn't be providing the the hair that the client would use. They would bring their own hair, so it would fit to what their needs would particularly be. Or just would be. Um, installing the hair. Thank you. Now, if the clients are going to be bringing their own hair in, um, is that something that's readily available at other places, or might that be another market for you to tap into to, uh, to sell that? Actually, that's another part of my um, whole spiel. Um, I have a friend that lives down in Atlanta. She works at a shop that's really similar to this prototype. She's been worked there for three years as a head stylist. So, as I was speaking of techniques and things of that nature. She knows that. That's no issue. And then um, we also, she also knows a girl or a girl that um, where you can get hair. Um, obviously, they buy them from different countries because it normally comes from Malaysia, Brazil, things of that nature. And, you know, obviously, with any type of product you buy, if you go straight to the middleman, it's going to be cheaper. Um, you know, if you buy it in bulk, obviously, um, that would be another service I was also, um, I would, uh, market inside the salon as well, his hair as well. I'd also like to acknowledge uh, we wouldn't be able to do a lot of this, uh, these things within our department if we didn't have the proper staff and support. And I'd like to acknowledge Mary Gunnarsson. Uh, there's Mary right there. If we give her a please, a nice round of applause. <laughs> For our final presenter. Uh, Nicholas Wyatt with Employee Review. Imagine yourself in a retail store. You're shopping, but you're having trouble finding exactly what you're looking for. So you go up to an employee and you ask them for help. They give you friendly, uh, good service. They take you exactly to where the item is and maybe they give you a few tips on how to use it. You've just had a great experience with this customer, but other than word of mouth, you really have no way to relay that to others. And as the employee, you have no way to record this experience and make a record of it for other people. Employee review is my idea for a new type of social network um, that will remedy this. It would be a website where the customer could go on and seek out the employee's profile they would have previous job um, experience, current job experience, maybe some qualifications they have, their skills, their knowledge, their abilities, kind of like a resume snapshot. 
but more importantly, it would be a hub for these positive reactions. The user on the other end would log in, find the helpful employee's profile, go in there and use a rating system to rate their level of satisfaction, and utilize comments to say what exactly they helped them with, uh, how well they did at their job, and just in general, how good of an experience they had, or potentially bad. Um, so after a period of time, hopefully this helpful employee would have collected a large base of positive comments and reviews about the work that they do. You could then equip yourself with this, these reviews from these customers and go to an employer and use it alongside your resume to create a powerful tool. Um, it's an additional way to sell yourself. It's a way to make the intangible tangible and it's a way to add value to yourself while you're looking for a new job. Now, one of the things would be, as a customer coming in, what would be the incentive for me to be able to go online and rate the person that I just dealt with? Because we all know that typically uh, you're not going to hear from anyone unless they have a complaint to say about it. You know, what's going to encourage me if I had a positive experience to make sure that your employer is aware of it so that d the statistics don't look lopsided so that all you're hearing is complaints all the time? Sure. Um, my main inspiration for this was that when I go to a store and I do have a positive experience, there, there's no system in place for me to compliment these people, even though I may want them or their employers to know that they're doing a good job. There's really, there's really nowhere to do that. Um, another thing that I thought about was if they do go on there and leave a review, um, perhaps some type of discount solution could be used if you were in association with different type of um, stores. They could get a coupon for that store where that employee worked. But mainly it was the, the thought that if, if people had an outlet for their good reactions that they would seek it out and use it if they knew about it. In the event of a negative experience that I have, does the employee have the opportunity to offer an explanation as to, uh, you know, to their employer, for instance, uh, maybe not make it public, but at least to be able to uh, be able to enter something in if they receive a negative review and say, you know, this is how my view of the situation is. This is how I thought I handled it properly, and you know, perhaps you know I could be given some further instruction as to how to do better next time. Yeah, absolutely. If, if you go to an employer and you're trying to seek a job and they see all these negative comments, I, I think you should have an, a, a chance to explain yourself. I also think that it's important for the negative comments because without them, you just have 100% positive comments and it kind of, it dilutes the value of the positive comments that people receive and it kind of take, takes away from that. Um, there would be an auditing system where you could, if someone was harassing or just being very egregious with their negative comments, you could go in and create, a, create an audit through the website and remove that. But like I said, the negative comments are also very important because they add more value to the positive. And is this going to be just a common courtesy or an actual business? And if it is a business, how are you going to make money off of it? Um, through traditional web ads, they would be placed on there, as well as um, if, if it is successful, people do have interest in it, um, a premium service would be offered. While, while you're on there, if you pay a, um, perhaps a membership, you could get access to a video series where people can help you kind of tailor your resume perhaps uh, an exclusive forum that non-members wouldn't be able to access where you could have industry professionals come in there and answer your questions. Um, but you know, those are the two outlets, mainly through web advertising, you know, traditional um, banner ads and paid links, and then the premium memberships as well. Yeah, so obviously you, you have to, to make this work, you need to uh, build up an employee database. And so what would your plan be to attract employees to, to register themselves, so to speak, on the, on the site? Uh, I think it's just a matter of, of getting it out there and making it known. Um, just, just advertising it and letting people know that this is a good way to add value to yourself. Like myself, I have a, a pretty limited resume, so this is another outlet for me. If I had a, like a profile of, of good comments, I can go to an employer and say, hey, you should, you should look at this. This is what all these people said about my work. Like I said, it... it people would use it to, to make the, the intangible tangible. You know, these comments are just being lost and employers don't know about them. So um, I just think people would seek it out and, and like to use it. I know I would. Did, uh, did you ever consider actually talking with business establishments uh, in terms of offering this sort of um, internet service and they would actually encourage maybe their employees to, to sign up? Yeah, if we or could maybe even mandate them to sign up. Sure, uh, if if I could partner with certain companies to to kind of get the word out, and it, it would allow 
the employees more confidence because they could see how they were doing, how people viewed them, and it would give the employers a unique perspective on what really is going on. You know, you, like I said, you don't always get the positive comments and sometimes not the negative, so it would give them an additional outlet to investigate how well the, uh, their employees are actually doing. And um, on another note, if, if you were seeking for a place to go, I know I would rather pay a, a little bit more for a product or a service if the customer ser satisfaction was higher, you know, opposed to cheaper price without customer satisfaction. So you could kind of view it, use it to review uh, outlets that have high ratings. From a business owner's standpoint, one of the concerns that I would have about the system is, is there any deterrent from my employees offering discounts to customers just to improve their ratings? You know, suddenly it's costing me money as a business uh, because they're cutting deals so that their ratings can go up. Is there any sort of safeguard for that? Sure. Um, like I said, it, it doesn't necessarily have to be those, those discounts offered, but um, if those were there, um, I'd like to have some type of system in place, kind of like eBay, where you see people who are leaving these comments, um, the frequency of the comments they make, and um, kind of the length, they, that could be taken into account to offer these discounts. Maybe you have to leave, you know, 10 reviews in order to get the coupon, something like that. Um, well, what I'm referring to is more on an employee's uh, standpoint. So I'm trying to, to sell you, um, you know, an item of clothing, and I say to you, hey, you know, uh, I can offer you a 15% off discount. And you know, if you're willing to go out and give me a positive review with my company, you know, now suddenly it's costing my employer money in order, you know, because I'm kind of being a little bit backhanded and trying to work around the system for my own benefit. But that goes into any sort of thought to a safeguard so that the employer doesn't actually lose money in the situation. Sure. Um, I guess I thought hadn't thought about too much about that. Uh, the main tie in with that was kind of like when you get a receipt and you call in and do a survey, then you do get a coupon like that. So my thought was that it would be more of a pr promotional thing than, than kind of deep cuts in cost. Sure. Unfortunately, not everyone in the world is honest. So. <laughs> so what's next? Now we've heard all the presenters present their great ideas. Uh, let's give one big round of applause to all the presenters. You're all winners <laughs> in our eyes. It takes a lot of courage to come up here and present your ideas. Um, on behalf of the business department, we are providing refreshments and food uh, just outside the auditorium while the judges deliberate. I would ask that you allow the judges to maybe grab a refreshment and some food as they go into a special room that we have for them. And uh, then we'll announce uh, the return of the judges and the awards will be given to first, second, and third place. Thank you very much. We're back. And with some exciting news, uh, first of all, uh, just a big round of applause for all of you, please. If you could just give yourselves a round of applause. No matter what happens tonight, first place, second place, great, you move on to regionals. Third place, you get some money. But then also keep in mind that the people who did not uh, win at the idea pitch were ones that went on to develop businesses and get quite a bit of seed capital as well. So don't let this deter you. Uh, the makeup of an entrepreneur is tenaciousness. Right, and uh, keep working on your idea, keep believing in yourself. I'm going to turn the mic over now uh, to the judges, and each judge would like to share a little bit with you about what they thought of tonight and uh, your presentations, and then they'll give me back the mic, and then I'll announce uh, the winners for tonight. Can I stand? Yeah. All right. Well, first off, I'd like to thank everybody for coming tonight. You guys had great ideas. You know, there's a lot of potential for for some of the ideas we heard tonight, whether they end up placing or not. Um, you know, I would just encourage you guys to pursue the ideas that you have, research them some more, see if there's other people out there, see if you can learn from what you find, what mistakes other, people's have, other people have made trying in this business. That's one of the things that, you know, I would say has been one of my strong points is looking at how other people have done things wrong and learning from the mistakes and listening, you know, to what other people have to say about it. But again, I just encourage you guys all and wish you the best of luck. Well, I, uh, I agree a lot with uh, Justin here that 
we heard a lot of great ideas, and I think a wise man once said that uh, the only bad idea is one that's not explored. And um, I just want to say that within GE in our, in our engineering, we actually do brainstorming sessions where we go around the table and ask for ideas just at the spur, spur of the moment. And uh, it's just a process we use. Uh, so we get a lot of different ideas out on the table, and then we talk about them and, and um, basically decides which ones are, are best to go with. And um, so it's a really important process to have ideas and to express ideas. And so I think this uh, competition is uh, very relevant to the real world. And uh, thanks for letting me par be part of it. <clears throat> All right. Uh, I, I would like to <laughs> I would like to uh, thank the um, GRC staff, including Felix Pereira, for having invited us to to be judged today. This has been a wonderful experience, and I second Justin as well as Randy as far as uh, encouraging you to continue to brainstorm or come up with ideas and to be persuasive and to, to stick with your ideas and your, <clears throat> and your gut feeling kind of a thing with these ideas that you're coming up with, so try and sell it. And I just wanted to share with you one of the things that I was reading before coming here this, af this afternoon was about uh, the president of France, Charles de Gaulle. Uh, Algeria was having <clears throat> kind of a revolution and it was a colony for France for many years and Charles de Gaulle went to Algeria and, con and convinced his compatriots that did not want to leave Algeria. And he was very persuasive. He, th he had the idea, and he, and he persuaded all his, all his compatriots to leave the country because fighting and winning was not going to avoid the, the independence of Algeria. But he was able to convince his compatriots to leave Algeria by persuading them. He had this idea, even though at the time they did not want to leave Algeria. They were very happy there. So be persuasive, just like how he was with your ideas. And thanks again for having me. <clears throat> this is fantastic. I mean, to have uh, Justin, I met him when he was very young, and he's built three, four different businesses. He's a job creator in Michigan, uh, creating over 50 jobs, especially in this economy. It's been very tough. Uh, so let's give a special round of applause for Justin. <clears throat> Randy is an incredible uh, engineer at General Electric and an incredible friend, and he's given a lot uh, to help people uh, solve technology problems and also to think with reason and logic, uh, and he's just a fabulous friend. Could we give Randy Walter a round of applause as well? And then Tony Bowie and I go back a long, long way. Uh, and again, it shows that Tony and I are immigrants to this country, that this is a great country. Uh, that if you come here with your ideas and you're willing to work and study uh, hard and uh, put in the, the clock time, that good things will happen for you. And Tony does that not only at General Electric, but also does that uh, on, for charity and in his own time as well. So big round of applause for <laughs> Tony. You know, it's really interesting that, you know, we have the idea pitch competition and we came up with the light bulb, and this was some of our students that came up with this. And also, if you take a look at the front of your program, it's a quote from Thomas Edison. And we really thank uh, General Electric for being very, very supportive of us, you know, especially with uh, Thomas Edison, of course, and General Electric having such close ties. Well, enough of that. Now we get down to what you would like to know is uh, who took first, who took second, and who took third place. So again, here we go. Let me get the first check ready here. In third place, Jennifer Van Plog. Come up here. Here we go. Let's get, let's get a picture. Let's get a picture here. She's, she's a close up here. There we go. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Second place. What might it be? What might it be? What might it be? Here we go. Damien Harden. Damien Harden. He's moving on to regionals. All right. 
Let's, let's get a picture here. Fantastic. Way to go, sir. That's right, Damien. If you take that check to any Chase Bank and you hand it to them. <laughs> no, Amy, Amy, I think will do a trade for you. How do we do that, Amy? They trade you the check and then they get something, okay? All right, well, we've been waiting for this first place, right? Very persuasive argument. Great idea and uh, great ability to share that idea. Jeffrey Knoll, first place. With Book Hippie. There you go. Excellent. Excellent. Both Jeffrey and Damien will be moving on to the competition. Uh, we invite many of you if you'd like to come. It's Wednesday, uh, August 7th. It's August 7th, Wednesday. I'm still in the summer. Department head duties here. Uh, it's uh, November 7th, Wednesday, next week. And it starts, Amy, at 6 o'clock? at 6 o'clock, so uh, you know, please keep them in your thoughts and maybe come out and support uh, Damien and Jeffrey, and we hope that uh, they take first or second place or both at uh, the Aquinas competition when they'll be competing against six other universities that are sending their two best as well. Again, a big round of applause for all of you. Thank you very much. God bless. Drive safe. Keep those in mind at the East Coast that are going through some storms right now. Take care. <laughs>